Next, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Anjali Tucker is a senior at MIT, double majoring in bio biology and material science and engineering. She conducts research on liver regenerative medicine and developed the Entrepreneurial Spirit, a mentorship entrepreneurship program to teach basic micro business principles to low income students in underserved communities. She hopes to continue to apply her engineering education and interest in medicine to a career in global community health and receive the Harry S. Truman Scholarship for her commitment to a career in public service. She's the founder and director of Tim Talks and will be attending Harvard Medical School this fall. Anjali will be speaking on a phenomenon known as the imposter syndrome and her inspiration for founding Tim Talks. Ladies and gentlemen, Anjali Thakur. I want you all to close your eyes. Think back to the first time you came to MIT, to the start of your career here as a student, staff, faculty member, whatever your relationship to the institute may be. Now raise your hand if you ever, even just once, thought that you didn't deserve to be here, thought that you'd fail once you got here, or thought that you got here by some stroke of luck. Keep your hands raised. <laughs> now keeping your hands raised, open your eyes and take a look around you. <laughs> this is why Tim Talks was created. Because at a wonderful institution like MIT, we're taught the core values of using humility and hard work to create success and tangible change. But we far too often forget that we are those agents of change. I felt this way far too often, all the time, in fact. I came to MIT as a freshman from an all-girls high school in the heart of the Silicon Valley. I loved my experience there, but I didn't come in with the strongest technical background. And I traveled 3,000 miles away from home, away from my family and strongest support system. And to tell you the truth, I felt lost. I came here, and I had become the small fish in this vast ocean that we call MIT, and it was scary. I didn't know what I was truly passionate about. I didn't have my niche here. I didn't have a community that I knew super well. And all of these things combined to make me feel nervous, anxious, isolated, inferior. And believe me, it was really difficult. And adding to all of that, academics here aren't necessarily the easiest. During my first 801 exam, I scored a 39%. And no, the average was not in the 30s, or the 40s, or the 50s, or even the 60s. <laughs> and this is especially hard because most of us come to MIT never really having failed before. So I cried to my mom, I cried to my dad, I sulked for a week, and then I was like, what am I doing? Is this really who I am? No, one bad grade had never got me down in the past, so why now? And if my friends were doing so much better than me, I'm sure they'd be willing to help me. So I did the one thing, the best thing that I could do. I reached out and asked for help. I started peace setting with my friends. I bothered my TAs and went to every single office hour for every 801 TA in that teal room that still gives me nightmares. I'm sure you can all relate. <laughs> but slowly, things started to change. Things started to turn around. If I failed at something, I bounced back and worked extra hard to overcome my shortcomings. And if I succeeded at something, I also worked hard because I didn't want to you know, not take advantage of my talents. So that was really exciting for me. And since then, I've become a Truman Scholar and been accepted to the medical school of my dreams. But the one thing that MIT has given me that's far more valuable than all of that is a sense of resilience, that I can fail but I will bounce back. And no amount of failure will set me back too much. So am I alone in feeling this way? Let's look at a cute picture to find out. So what's the first thing that you see when you look at this picture? The goose and a tux. <laughs> the goose and a tux, thank you. Yes, there's three penguins and one goose in a bow tie and a tuxedo trying its hardest to fit in, but more importantly, trying to remain unnoticed. In other words, you have three penguins and one imposter. Funny enough, that's kind of how I felt when I got here. I felt like a fake, like an imposter amidst all my very talented peers. In, sh in short, I suffered from something known as the imposter phenomenon, 
which was a phenomenon studied by psychologists Suzanne Imes and Pauline Clance in 1978. They worked with 150 young, or actually not young women, they were women of all different ages and backgrounds, who all shared one undeniable similarity, that they had all succeeded in their lives, whether through high achieving jobs, scholastic achievements, academic publications, you name it. And yet, when they were talked to, they thought that they had all achieved success by tricking their peers. In the words of Imes and Clance, they thought they were phonies. Over the past four years, I've had the opportunity to talk about this phenomenon, not necessarily the phenomenon, but just the feeling of the imposter syndrome with a lot of people. And the evidence overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly points towards the existence of the imposter syndrome in our very own high achieving community. And what's more, it's not just among us students, but staff feel it, faculty feels it, I'm sure our president has even felt it at some point. And there was this article in the New York Times a few years ago where they discussed other studies that were conducted nationwide on the imposter syndrome. And the thing that comforted me was that every single person at some point in their life will face some form of the imposter syndrome. But more importantly, this defense mechanism can be used it's a psychological defense mechanism, but it can be used to overcome failure through self-reflection, which ultimately can lead to success. Last year, the Department of Physics at MIT published a paper on this diversity and inclusion luncheon that they held to discuss this very phenomenon. In it, they highlighted something that they called the malleable mindset, in which having this mindset of malleability would allow you to accept momentary failure and then move on from it and achieve success. Whereas people with hard set minds would be like, well, I failed. That's a barrier to success. I'm never going to succeed. So it's important to have this malleable mindset. And I'm glad that the Department of Physics ventured out into this territory. So since then, I've talked a lot about, I, I've talked a lot about you know, the malleable mindset and the imposter phenomenon. But how did I overcome my imposter syndrome? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't really. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, I'm crazy. How can failure and, and, and a psychological defense mechanism somehow lead to success? Well, let's look at a couple of, of prominent fields as an example. In medicine, the field that I hope to pursue in the future, all institutions hold periodic morbidity and mortality conferences, where high-achieving, high-level scientists come together to discuss the failures and mistakes that they've made in treating their patients. They discuss these failures so that in the future, they'll have success. In entrepreneurship, which I'm sure you all had a taste of yesterday at the MIT 100K, every successful venture is a result of a handful of failed companies. In engineering, which you are all pros at, and which we as an institute pride ourselves on, you can't have success without analyzing failure. The core components of engineering are a, 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 a composite of classes known as failure, failure analysis. In my own department of materials engineering, I know that you can't really understand if a material is going to succeed until you understand its threshold of failure. And finally, there's the timeless example of sports. As my older brother and role model always tells me, all of the, the baseball players who've been elected to the Hall of Fame, all of them boast batting averages in the 300s. Then I would ask him, but that means they failed seven out of 10 times. That's not really cool. But then he'd tell me, yes, but 10 out of 10 times, they stepped up to that plate thinking that today was going to be their lucky day. Today, they were going to do something for the team and really make a difference. And that's how they got three out of 10 successes. So you see, failure really isn't that bad all, after all. It teaches you things, and it gives you perspective that build character. And in the case of my less than stellar 801 exam, it puts pride in its place with a dose of humility and motivation. So now maybe you're wondering, well, how did I overcome my imposter syndrome? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't really. But I have gone a long way in the past four years that I've been here, and I'll tell you how. I found myself engaging with my community through service. And through this, I found a niche, something I'm truly passionate about. And I've built a community of people who share my values. And through this, my academic journey has become so much more inspiring, exciting, intriguing, and it's made all the difference in my MIT experience. 
During my sophomore year here, I worked with the Public Service Center to create a program called the Entrepreneurial Spirit. It was a mentorship entrepreneurship program aimed at teaching basic skills in microbusiness to young women in underserved communities. I worked out all of the details. I wrote a curriculum that incorporated concepts like what's a business model, what's product design, how do you manage an inventory, how do you create a marketing model. And I had all the details planned out with the PSC and with my, my, my partners in India, and everything was set to go. I was excited. And then I got to Bombay, India, and I arrived at the KLM Vidyadam School for Girls, where I was to implement this program. And all of a sudden, I realized that my vision was not really what they were envisioning. So I started to view the project as a failure. How had this, how had this, this slipped me before? But then I kept in touch with my lovely mentors from the Public Service Center, who are all here today, and they prodded me with intriguing, insightful questions. They told me to look at any opportunity as an advantage and to keep an open mind, most importantly. So I did just that. I figured, well, I don't really know the girls I'm going to be working with, so let me take this as an opportunity to get to know them. And when I started to talk to them, I realized that they came from all different ages and backgrounds, and they didn't really know each other that well either. So I conjured up my great memories of FLP, the Freshman Leadership Preorientation Program that I did four years ago. And I came up with some icebreakers that I'd done before. And as, as a team, we did them together. So here's a picture of some of the girls holding hands with a fiery team spirit after having devised a strategy to beat all the other teams in a game of the human knot. Over the next six weeks, these young women developed the skills and, and developed their own businesses on a very small scale. But nonetheless, they developed business models, product models, marketing models. They held an, account tree, uh, an inventory and accounting, and they learned so much. The products ranged from jewelry and food to crafts and pottery. But most importantly, over those six weeks, I watched 60 girls who feared failure transform into 60 young women who wanted to take a risk. So although my project was successful, it taught me something far more important and far more powerful, the value of perspective. After spending six weeks with these young women who inspired me, I came back to MIT that semester excited and reju rejuvenated with the spirit that never has died since. And now I know that whatever career path I choose to take in the future, I want it to incorporate some form of service. So where does Tim Talks come into all of this? Tim Talks, as you know, was created as a forum for students to discuss their successes and their achievements, but more importantly, to discuss the challenges and failures that they experienced along the way. Here at MIT, where we celebrate success so much, we forget to applaud failure as a necessary first step. Now, how many of you related to my experience about introductory physics? I want to see the hands, because I know it's all of you. <laughs> well, so did this person, who I know is in the audience. I, I, was chan I chanced upon this image at last night when I was going to publicize Tim Talks on Facebook. And it says, Professor Grudzinski understands us. And it has a picture of 802 and someone being strangled. <laughs> We've all failed. So why don't we just come together as a community, talk about it, share the experience, and most importantly, why don't we grow from it? Over the past few years, or past few months actually, as seniors, my peers and I have often been put on a pedestal for being so put together, for having our lives all figured out. But now you know we fail too, and in a pretty big way. Failure is natural, so we need to talk about it. We need to use it as an impetus for change. <laughs> Tim, Tim Talks was created as a forum for discussion of failure, and this year hasn't been the easiest for MIT. We've had a lot of problems in terms of student life and student culture, and we deeply mourn these losses. But I think it's high time that we as students take advantage of this as an opportunity to do something to modify a student culture and community that we cherish and love so much. So let's step up to the plate, accepting fully well the possibility that we may strike out. And let's think, inspire, and motivate. And show the rest of the world that we will do this, and that we will use service and technology to change the world. <laughs>